Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Ron Vale from Genelia Research Campus, and I'd like to welcome uh, everyone this morning to Life Science Across the Globe. Uh, so we uh, began this series in uh, July of last year uh, when there was uh, many of our seminar series uh, were um, ceased at the moment, and there's a great need to communicate with one another. And also the series uh, recognized the very important need for uh, recognizing uh, life science as a global effort and the fact that scientists uh, from continents around the world uh, need to communicate and exchange ideas of their work. And uh, since then, we've had a weekly uh, seminar. Um, they've been fantastic. Uh, science talk and science culture talk, I've attended every one of them. Uh, many of you in the audience have as well. And uh, they've been absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, uh, and we've recently uh, met as uh, sister institutes and uh, uh, agreed that the series should be continued, that it serves uh, uh, an enormous uh, need for international communication in the life sciences. Um, so we will continue this effort, uh, but I should say that we will be taking uh, a momentary pause uh, while the sister institutes reconvene and reimagine what this series uh, uh, might look like for the coming year and how to uh, best serve the communication of science and deliver uh, an outstanding uh, series of talks uh, to an international audience. So um, uh, again, we will be taking um, a brief pause after this, but I would encourage you to uh, return to our website in the future and look for news uh, about uh, the upcoming Life Science Across the Globe uh, series. So with that, um, I'd like to today welcome uh, our sister institute the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina uh, and Conocet, and uh, um, welcome uh, Alberto Kornblit, uh, who will introduce today's speakers. Um, Alberto is uh, a highly recognized uh, scientist. Uh, he is a foreign member of the US National Academy, and uh, he's won many awards uh, from Argentina, including investigator of the Argentine nation, an award uh, delivered by uh, the president. He also serves on the board of directors for the Argentine National uh, Research Council. Um, and uh, Alberto also delivered one of our uh, uh, very early talks, I think our um, third science talk in this series. So I encourage you to look at it. It's a, it's a really beautiful talk uh, that uh, combines uh, an incredible mechanistic uh, work on um, alternative splicing, but also how he's been able to um, connect that information of basic science uh, to thinking about how to treat disease. And in his example, he talked about a neurological disease, which is spinal muscular atrophy. So I encourage you to watch that talk. But now, uh, finally, I would like to uh, bring on uh, Alberto to uh, introduce today's speakers. Alberto. Okay, thank you very much, Ron, for your long and kind introduction. Uh, I am very happy to be the head of one of the sister institutes of this uh, series, and I hope that we can produce a second wave of uh, uh, seminars uh, with a different shape. So I'm very pleased to introduce the two speakers of today, uh, Daniel Tomsik and Carolina Vera. Uh, Daniel obtained his degree in biology at the University of Mar del Plata in Argentina and his PhD at the University of Buenos Aires under the supervision of late Professor Hector Maldonado. The Maldonado group has done pioneering work in memory and behavior using a non-conventional animal model such as the flat crab Neohilis granulata that lives in the coast of the southwestern Atlantic Ocean on the beaches of Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. Daniel was a visiting scientist at the Naples Zoological Station in Italy 
and did postdoctoral work in the USA as visiting fellow of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke of the NIH. He was also guest researcher at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and at present he is principal investigator of the CONICET and professor of the School of Sciences of the University of Buenos Aires. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers and in particular to Alberto for inviting me to give this talk. Today, I am going to present you some of our results on neuronal basis for collision avoidance behaviors. But before, before doing that, I would like to, 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 to describe the general context in which these behaviors take, takes place. Um, when we navigate in a crowded or in a cluttered environment, we need to uh, avoid colliding with, with objects that are in front of us, that we are approaching them, or with objects that are approaching us. And we have to do it timely in order to implement the right uh, strategy to avoid the collision. But we are not the only species that uh, have to uh, solve the problem because birds, flying insects, fishes, and even crabs need, need to avoid collision when they navigate in the environment. Another um, context in which uh, to estimate the time to collision is important is in sports. Uh, if you think in this uh, soccer player, in order to hit the ball uh, correctly, he has to calculate the time of the impact uh, to make the goal. And uh, even if you think, even more if you think in the, in the tennis player that had to return a uh, service that is approaching at 200 kilometers per hour, the precision of the uh, hit has to be in the order of uh, uh, milliseconds. So when we cross a street, we uh, pay attention and calculate the time remaining till uh, the, the, the approaching car can reach us. And when we drive behind a car, we uh, also press the brake gradually in order to, um, to keep the distance. So all these actions are performed based on the information that we get, uh, the information about the rate of expansion of the image of the approaching object on our retina. Now, for an observer, the apparent size of an approaching object expands as a function of the velocity and the real size of the, of the object. So if you, you plot the angular size of the object against the time to collision from the point of view of the observer, what you uh, get is a, a curve <clears throat> that is steeper for an object that are approaching faster. So the dynamic of image expansion on the retina provides information on the time remaining to collision. Now, for a human player uh, that has a big brain, these calculations, we know for sure that can be done. But the question will be, do you, uh, such computations requires a big brain? And the answer is certainly no, because <clears throat> Insects with their small brains can uh, skillfully fly within a cluttered environment without, without colliding with the objects. And anyone that has attempted to capture uh, a bothering fly knows how well equipped these creatures are to avoid the collision. Uh, probably the most uh, important context where these behaviors are studied are in the context of escape behaviors because avoidance responses to looming objects are ancient reactions displayed by most animals. And these uh, behaviors must be performed, uh, performed in a fast and in a, in, in a reliable way in order to fulfill its biological meaning. And for this, the neural circuits, circuits are straightforward and contain giant neurons that are accessible for a, a physiological studies. Besides, these behaviors are easy to evoke in the laboratory. So invertebrates have been a very useful experimental model and studies in invertebrates have uh, provided fundamental knowledge about uh, the, in the field of neuroscience. So in the case of uh, collision avoidance, the classical animal model has been the locust. In these animals, they found a large neuron in the third optic neuropile, is this neuron here, that is highly sensitive to 
an object approach. So for this reason, these type of neurons are called collision sensitive neurons. And a lot of studies has been done on the computation performed by these neurons to object approach. More recently, uh, amazingly beautiful study has been done in, in Drosophila, where they also found, found in the lobula a number of neurons uh, that uh, are collision sensitive neurons. And these neurons are being studied um, with the genetic, unique genetic advantages that you have in this, in this, in this model. So you have the model of uh, low cost, you have, uh, Jani, uh, you have uh, the, the, the fruit fly. So you can ask why to develop other animal models for studying collision detection. And uh, I think that there are a number of reasons, some of them are here. No single animal model offer advantages for all kinds of experimental approaches. Uh, for instance, flying insects move in three dimensions, which make behavior analysis far more complicated than for animals moving in two dimensions. Um, by focusing the study in a single animal, we can never know whether our findings are specific for that particular species or they are general principles. And uh, it shall be pointed out that ele electrophysiology remains nowadays the dominant methodology to investigate neuronal activity in the range of high temporal resolution, which is milliseconds, that characterizes the transfer of information within the nervous system. Yet, there are few experimental models in which the computations involving collision avoidance behavior can be investigated at the level of single identified neurons with electrophysiological techniques. So for uh, these and other reasons, about 15 years ago, we started to study collision avoidance using uh, a new uh, experimental model, uh, the Krab Neohelice Granulata. Uh, among one of the reasons, or some of the reasons why we choose these animals are uh, listed here. They are highly amenable animals for in vivo intracellular recordings. They live in a relatively simple flat environment and moves in two dimensions. Uh, they, they are wild animals, uh, which means that they can, their behavior can be studied in the lab and in the field. And this is a point that I will come back at the end of my talk. So these crabs lives, lives, as I said, in a relatively um, simple environment, which is called the mood flat. And in this uh, environment, they are captured uh, by gulls and also by larger crabs. So when there is an object uh, that, are, that is approaching the crab, um, the crab runs away. And in the laboratory, we study the escape response of the animal by using a treadmill device. And we simulate the uh, attack of a predator using luminous stimuli. So in this video, you can see the conditions, uh, our experimental condition. The object is expanding, simulated that is approaching. The object ignores, the crab ignores it till a point in which it decides to start running away. And the escape response is highly directional. When the stimulus approaches from the left, all the animals go to the right and vice versa. And the escape ramp is not ballistic but continually adjusted according to the incoming visual information. Uh, in this graph, what you can observe is the response of the crabs, the velocity of escape of the crabs for a particular dynamic of a stimulus expansion, but the expansion was stopped at different uh, moments. And what you see is that the crabs stop uh, or, or decelerate the, the response immediately after uh, the stop of the image expansion which means that the animal is all the time assessing the visual information and, and, and using this information to control the behavior. Now, one important question in the field of collision avoidance that you want to ask the animal is, uh, which is the stimulus parameter that it uses uh, to take into account, that it takes into account to decide initiating the escape? Um, to answer this question, what you have to do is to determine the moment in which the animal decides to initiate the escape and then look at, look at the um, different parameters, the value of the different parameters of the stimulus at that particular moment. So you can, for instance, look at the angular size of the object, uh, but the, 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 the criteria will be based on the 
uh, angular increase or in the uh, uh, what is called the retinal speed, that is the velocity of expansion of the borders of the image, or can be the, the, the acceleration of the borders. So in order to try to um, find what is the criteria used by the, the, the animals, uh, what you have to do is to apply different uh, dynamics of expansion. In this case, this graph represents the expansions of uh, objects that have different sizes but approach at the same velocity. And in this case, an object of a, a unique size but is approaching a different velocity. And the idea is that with all these different dynamics, you look at the moment in which the animal initiates the escape and you try to find out uh, a common value for a particular parameter for all the dynamics. So if you find out, you can uh, uh, conclude, sort of conclude that the, that is the, um, the, the parameter that is using the animal. So we did this, um, these experiments, we apply eight different uh, dynamics of expansion. And what you can see, for instance, is that, is that the, there is a clear relationship between the dynamic, the moment of the escape initiation and the velocity of escape uh, with, a, with a dynamic of, of expansion. For instance, for an object that is approaching uh, more rapidly, you have an early uh, initiation of the response and a more rapid increase in the velocity of escape that for objects are approaching more, uh, more slowly, as you can see here. So the first things that we did was to pay attention to the initiation of the response. Uh, and we look at the parameters and the value in the different parameters. Uh, so we uh, analyzed what was the angular size at the moment of uh, escape initiation for all the dynamics. And we found that there were different values of angular size. So this is clear, not the criteria that the animal was uh, using to decide the escape. We also look at the angular velocity and angular acceleration, and none of these criteria have a common value. So uh, what we found was the uh, angular increment, an increment of seven degrees uh, in the size of the object, uh, was the criteria common to all the different dynamics that the animal used to initiate the escape. So then we apply a similar uh, sort of analysis to, um, to know what was the uh, parameter of a stimulus that the animal uses to control, to continually control uh, its velocity of escape. And we found an input-output relationship that just by taking the stimulus angular increment multiplied by the stimulus angular velocity, we can predict very well for all the dynamics at, at any time of the, of, the, of, the, of the escape, what will be the velocity of escape of the animal. So with this uh, behavior information, then we uh, wanted to look for neurons that may encode part of the information that underlies these visual motor transformations. Um, for doing that, we had the advantage that, that we can do intracellular recordings in an almost intact animal. We just have to make a small hole in the tip of the eye stock. We uh, go with the microelectrode and the animal is almost intact. We record neurons in particular from the third optic neuropile from the lobula because there you find huge neurons that are highly sensitive to motion. And these are some of the neurons that we have been studying. Uh, in particular, the MLG1 and MLG2 are neurons that are highly sensitive to uh, approaching objects. So this is, these are uh, what we call collision sensitive neurons. So we have applied uh, the different dynamics um, to the animal while we were recording the response of these neurons. And uh, we found that these neurons clearly reflect the dynamic of expansion. For example, an object that is expanding more rapidly or approaching more rapidly, uh, you have that the neuron respond earlier and uh, the rate of increase uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the firing is, 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 uh, is more rapid. That for a stimulus that is approaching uh, more slowly. So what we found uh, after some analysis is that in fact, these neurons um, uh, compute the velocity uh, of expansion of the, of the angular velocity of the stimulus. Um, if you remember from our behavior analysis, the angular velocity of a stimulus was one of the parameters that allow us to predict what will be the velocity of escape of the animal. 
So what we did was to replace the optical parameter by the information provided by the neuron at any moment. And with this information, we were able to predict uh, quite nicely what, is the, what will be the velocity of escape of the animal for all the different dynamics of expansion and at any time. So from this kind of uh, results, we conclude that the MLG1 and MLG2 neurons encode the information about the angular velocity of the stimulus, which is conveyed downstream to control the escape velocity of the animal. But uh, the time is not the only thing that the animal have, an animal has to, um, to, to, to control in order to uh, avoid a collision, because the animal also has to know from which part of the visual space the object is approaching um, and uh, in order to, to make the right, uh, the right uh, directional control. So in the case of uh, crabs, uh, they avoid a visual danger by a mechanism that implies a rotatory movement. What they do is to rotate, put the object in the lateral part of the visual field. They keep tracking the object with the lateral part of the visual field and uh, in this way, they can run side away, which is the faster running uh, way for these animals. Um, the area of the eye uh, in which they fixate the object is uh, the lateral part of the eye where this animal has the maximal uh, visual resolution. So what we did were a series of experiments uh, to try to understand this uh, control of uh, tracking behavior. Uh, for doing that, we presented uh, a luminous stimulus in different position, a simultal position around the crab. So it was uh, one stimulus at 90 degree, another situation at 120, 150, so from the back. Now a little bit from the front, 60 and 30 degrees. So in this particular situation, for example, if the animal wants to put the object in the lateral part of the closest eye, which in this case is the left eye, it will attempt to turn to the right, uh, which in our setup, that will be recorded as a rotation of the ball in the anti-clockwise direction. Now, in this video, you will see this situation because uh, the crab is oriented 30 degrees with re respect to the, to the stimulus. The stimulus start to uh, grow, simulating that it is approaching, and the animal uh, very immediately will start to attempt to rotate uh, toward the right, and for this reason, the the, the ball is rotating toward the, uh, in the anti-clockwise direction. So when we uh, analyze it, this, uh, the results of this, uh, the, the, these results, what we found was that there was a, um, and we measured the velocity of rotation of the animal, what we found was that uh, when the animals saw the stimulus at 90 degree, the rotation was null. But when the animals uh, saw, um, but there was a, a, an increase in the in the velocity of rotation for both sides when uh, the animal saw uh, the the stimulus <clears throat> with a larger deviation from the 90 degrees from the phase 18 point. So what we conclude uh, is that there is a position sensitive mechanism in these animals that by taking into account the error angle to the fixating point, uh, they can use this information in order to control the velocity of rotation that will suppress the error. Then we wanted to know if we can find some neurons that are underlying this, uh, this behavioral control. And for doing that, we present uh, a stimuli, moving a stimuli in the anterolateral part of the visual field of the animals or in the lateral posterior area, uh, visual area of the animals. Uh, we found that uh, some highly directionally sensitive cells, uh, these are two examples. In this uh, neuron, uh, the response, the excitatory response was for an object that was moving toward the left, and there was an inhibition when the stimulus was moving to, to the right. And in this uh, second neuron, the example is the opposite. The neuron was sensitive or excited by a stimulus moving to the right and inhibited by the stimulus moving to the left. Uh, the direction in which the neuron uh, shows the excitation is usually uh, called the preferred direction of the neuron. 
and we call these neurons LCDC by lobular complex directional cells by their position in the in the anatomy. Now there are there is a very interesting uh, result with this neuron, which is an association. This neuron have an association, a strong association between the receptive field and the uh, preferred direction. For example, in this uh, neuron that is exemplified here, the, uh, the receptive field is on the lateral posterior region of the visual field. So in this region here. And the preferred direction is a uh, clockwise direction. Whereas in this other neuron here, the uh, excitatory response it occurs, so the receptive field is in the anterolateral part of the visual field, is over here, and the preferred direction is anticlockwise. So we recorded 22 uh, of these uh, kind of neurons in different animals, and what we found is that half of uh, the, our recording, recorded neurons uh, had the receptive field in the anterior uh, part of the visual field, that the anterior part of the visual field, and all of them have a, a preferred direction that was anticlockwise, so this direction here. Whereas the other half, uh, the other 11 neurons have uh, the receptive field in the uh, lateral posterior region, and the preferred direction was, um, was uh, a clockwise direction. So from these uh, results, uh, our interpretation is that when escaping from a visual thread, crabs track the moving object with the lateral visual pole, and this is achieved through a position sensitive mechanism that by detecting the sign and the amount of deviation from the closest lateral pole, controls the direction and the velocity of rotation of the animal in order to keep the stimulus at 90 degrees. Uh, we propose that this uh, it occurs through the highly sensitive directional neurons, the LCDCs, and this will work more or less in this way. Uh, this neuron, uh, that is uh, uh, shown here, doesn't respond when the object is moving in the anterior part of the visual field uh, in any direction. Uh, the neuron doesn't respond when the stimulus is moving in the uh, back uh, uh, field, in the back part of the field, uh, in this direction. But when the direction is the opposite, when this is departing from 90 degrees, the neuron responds very strongly. And something similar, but uh, uh, the counterpart of this occurs with other neurons that do not respond in any direction, except when the stimulus is moving in this uh, area of the visual field and with this direction, departing from the 90 degrees. So um, the idea is that when an object is moving in this area and with this direction, uh, this is the neuron that is going to be activated. And the activation of this neuron will convey the information to, uh, to control the uh, right turning of the animals in order to keep fixing the object with the lateral pole. Whereas when uh, an object is moving in this direction and this part of the visual field, it will be the neuron, the new blue neuron that is activated. And uh, when this neuron uh, is activated, uh, the information will be for the animal to turn uh, anti-clockwise in order to keep tracking the, the, the object. So the idea is that LCDCs will operate as a deviation detector system for tracking object with the lateral visual pole. Now, before finishing my talk, I would like to briefly answer uh, these questions. So what about the field? Uh, do the animals behave like in the lab? And to answer this question, we perform um, field uh, studies using a methodology uh, developed by Jan Hemi. And uh, what we do is to use a dummy uh, to simulate the approach of a predator. And this dummy is moved over the natural environment of the animals. And we record the behavior of the animals using two uh, cameras. In the next video, you will see um, uh, this scenario. And uh, you will see uh, the dummy approaching from the right side of the screen. And please pay attention to the direction of escape of the animals and the time of the, of the escape. So here you have one animal, another one here, another one here, and the dummy will come from here. So you can see that the crab is running against the dummy. So in fact, there are clear differences uh, in the escape behavior uh, between the lab and the field. In the laboratory, 
uh, all the animals run directly away from the direction in which the stimulus is approaching. Whereas in the field, the animals go, the animals go to, the, to, to, to the barrel and they can do that even running against the stimulus. Uh, on the other hand, another important difference is that in the field, the, animal, the animals respond much earlier when the stimulus is uh, farther away, which means that when uh, the angular size of the stimulus is much smaller than what we uh, found in the laboratory. And uh, the, our, the interpretation for this is uh, because the animals uh, don't have a, 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 um, a shelter nearby in the laboratory, they use a different strategy as a first option, which is a freezing strategy uh, to try to be undetected. And uh, only when the stimulus approach uh, uh, enough or, or grows too much, the animals decides to switch to a different strategy, which is the, the escape response. So from this combination of field and behavioral studies, um, we found that crabs assess the risk based on the stimulus, but also on contextual information. So it's more complex than what we co can conclude from laboratory studies. Um, so in a, to, to, to provide a, a general summary for my talk, I will say that for understanding the biological mechanism underlying collision avoidance, animals with small brains are suitable experimental models that the development of new animals is very important, that behavioral studies in the laboratory with the designed stimuli allows to identify the visual parameters used by an animal to decide and guide the different components of its avoidance response. And that these different results component, response components, such as the velocity and the direction of escape, involve continu continuously adjusted visual motor transformations precisely encoded in the firing rate of collision sensitive neurons. Now, studies in the lab with uh, rather artificial stimuli and response conditions are powerful because they allow to link the neural electrophysiological responses with the behavioral responses to exactly the same stimuli. However, it is important to keep in mind that animals do not live and act in the lab as they do in the real world. So in order to understand the true animal's ability, a combination of lab and field studies is required. So finally, just let me to acknowledge uh, the people in my life, in my lab, uh, present uh, and past uh, students that have contributed to uh, part of the results that I presented today. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, very interesting talk on an everyday behavior that we all can so well relate to. I mean, you gave some great real life examples and driving is something that I can instantaneously you know, relate to. Um, I liked how you walked us through the importance of simple animals with small brains as models to study the underlying mechanism behind these behaviors. But then my question is how well is this conserved across species? I mean, to what extent can we extrapolate what we learned from invertebrates in the lab to a real life scenario in a higher order organism? for example, driving? Yeah, uh, good question. Well, as I, uh, as I try to show, even in, in, in invertebrates, the situation is complex and depends very much, not only on the stimulus uh, uh, information, but also on the contextual information. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that uh, for, the, for, for the information that we already have from the studies that have been done in invertebrates, uh, and, and in other species like fishes, um, the, the, the parameters that the animals uh, use uh, as a main parameter of the image expansions are more, like, more or less the same. But uh, the advantage that you have with the invertebrates that are more difficult to, to, to have in invertebrates is that you can identify uh, particular neurons, specific neurons in an animal um, that perform these computations. So this is uh, one of the important uh, reasons why we study uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this phenomenon, this problem in, in invertebrates or in, in, in particular in, in arthropods. Indeed, you can isolate the particular neurons. Um, all right, let's move on to some audience questions here. Uh, we have a great question from Paul. 
Uh, Paul, will you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, hi Daniel, how are you doing? Hi, Paul. Um, so I, I wanted to know what happens when there's multiple objects. Do the interneurons inhibit each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting question. Uh, there are some behavioral studies uh, uh, from my colleague, uh, Jan Hemi, in the field. So these are behavioral studies that show what, that when there is two objects approaching the animal, even if the, 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 the objects approaches at the same time and there are similar objects from different directions, uh, the animal decide to uh, pay attention to one of them. So we think that probably there is uh, an inhibition uh, between the, neur the neurons that compute information from one part of a visual field uh, to neurons that compute information from other parts of the visual field. But um, we don't have the answer at the neural level yet. Thanks. Thank you. Um... We, our next question is from Natalie. Uh, Natalie, please go ahead, ask your question. Hi, Daniel, uh, nice talk, thank you very much. I actually had the same question as the previous speaker. So uh, I wonder if in your setup with the um, treadmill, you could uh, actually explore that question different to the field because you could, uh, you, you'd, you control the context much uh, more closely and uh, the animal does not decide between going to goal, the borrow and somewhere else. So do you have a very specific behavioral context? So I wonder if, you, if you've tried that. Well, we have uh, explored the decision making uh, made by these uh, animals in a situation where, for instance, we present the stimulus right from above. So uh, in that situation, half of the animals goes to the right, go, uh, go to the right, and half of the animal go to the left, because it, it, everything is equal, contextually speaking. But when we introduce some uh, asymmetries, for instance, uh, well, we polarize one of the lights from one of the screen, uh, or, or we put uh, a long bar in one of the screen, the decision, again, is biased uh, to, to, to one of the sides. So yes, we can explore that uh, contextual um, effect on the, on, the, on the treadmill. Great, uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, our next question is from Diana. Diana, go ahead, please. Sorry, uh, here. Uh, Diana, would you- Can you? you? It's okay, no? Yes. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Daniel, nice talk. Uh, I, I wonder, what could be the role of learning in the behavior uh, of the, those neurons, uh, particularly thinking in natural conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also an interesting question. Uh, as you know, Diana, we have uh, worked quite a lot on, on learning and memory before starting to work with this uh, um, field of collision avoidance. And uh, we know that some of these neurons uh, change uh, the responsiveness according to the um, frequency of presentation of the stimulus. So if the stimulus is uh, presented uh, too often, the, the, there is a reduction in the behavior of the animals in the escape response. And this is reflected by a reduction, a change in the, in the, in the response of the neurons. And in some cases, these changes can last for 24 hours. Uh, and these changes are uh, context specific. So um, these neurons uh, apparently act as, um, as in, in, in the direct uh, pathway uh, that links the, the sensory information with the motor pathway, but they also uh, underlie some, 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 um, some changes related to, to learning and memory. Something like that has been uh, described many years ago uh, in Drosophila, there's some changes in the in the uh, in, uh, produced by learning can occur in, in a quite direct path, pathway. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Daniel. Daniel, one question from me here. Uh, you spoke about one sti one stimulus, but what happens in a situation where you have multiple stimuli, like you have visual stimulus and auditory stimulus? Do they complement each other and enhance the response? Huh. 
this is a, an experiment that I always have in mind because there are some uh, quite old papers that uh, describe that crabs can, uh, can display a, a stronger escape response if you uh, combine visual and uh, some auditory information. Uh, but we haven't done that experiment yet. Hmm. Interesting. Well, once again, thanks for the great talk and the wonderful discussion. Uh, and with that, uh, we will move on to our next speaker, Carolina Vera, uh, to hear about a scientific view of climate challenges.